um, I can say, yo, come in. If you yep. knock on the door, mid-podcast. But the problem is the door's awkward. So they can't open the door. <laughs> so so they're still is, banging. It's just, Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> it should be all right. But it, it's probably, he, people are rocking up at five o'clock because the bar opens then. Right, right, anyway, I'm waffling. Simon Hannaford. Yes. Is how you pronounce your I have to check every time. Hannaford, uh, yep. Hannaford? Yep. Han- it's, uh, it's Cornish. Go on. Yeah, uh, so... <laughs> I, I mean, it... it <laughs> I've I've opened up a can of worms now. So when I was over in Northern Ireland, there was a guy over there that did a lot to do with uh, names, uh, and he was like straight away, "You're from Cornwall, aren't you?" And I'm like, uh, "Well, I'm kind of from Plymouth, but most of my family are from Cornwall." Um, and around like the 17th, 18th century, keep talking. Adjust that camera. Keep going. Half of my family stayed within uh, Cornwall, uh, and the other half kind of disappear to America. Um, and that's where the Hannaford uh, shopping centres are now in America from my descendants, well, not my descendants, but my my kin over in America. Yeah. So is the... Oh, God. Um, sorry, mate. Is the, uh, is the, is the Hannaford... Is that like from the Americans? Is that, is that why it's Hannaford? <laughs> yeah. like the, the American thing. They always say things weird, don't they? Yeah. It's like everyone, everyone has little different ways of saying things. Like I've got a friend back home um, from South Wales. And whenever he goes to somewhere and in the name of the place is Mouth, like Plymouth, he pronounces it like mouth yeah. off the Plymouth. In fact, he listens to the <laughs> podcast. I've just re- realised he listens to the podcast. Jamie Barnes, I'm talking about you. <laughs> Where are you off today, Jamie? I'm off the way. I'm just in Weymouth. Plymouth. Portsmouth. No one else says that, Jamie. No one else says it. Anyway, sorry, Barnes. Sorry. I'm glad you to listen. <laughs> <laughs> he was actually complaining yesterday because, uh, well, it was a veiled complaint because there's been a couple of weeks of a lull of podcasts. Oh, right. Okay. But he, he's, he's whinging. He doesn't put it like a whinge. Oh, yeah. podcasts are a bit slower than me, aren't they? Yeah, really, he's saying, get the fucking podcast out of you. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, 27 years and counting in EOD? Uh, well, uh, I originally joined the army as a driver specialist, uh, thinking that I would follow my dad's path. So my dad wasn't in the army, he was a mechanic. Uh, and I wanted to be a mechanic, so I went to the uh, um, recruiting centre and said, this is what I want. I want to be like my dad. I want to be a mechanic. They said, all right, okay, yeah. Go and do the test. So I went away and did the test, came back. He said, oh, yeah, you you scored really well. Um, This is a job for you. Uh, I was like, what's that? You can pretty much drive all of these big sort of machines, and then when they break down, you get to fix them. I'm like, mega. I want to do that. So June... Oh, well, sorry, November 1995, stepped on the train, got to basic training and found out that driver specialist isn't quite as mechanical as I thought. So what they were trying to refer to is that if a light bulb breaks, I will then be qualified to unscrew said <laughs> light bulb and then put a new light bulb in. Um, so I stayed with that. I know it was, it was a really cool, cool um, trade. Uh, I got to play with cranes and all of the diggers and mad type of engineering type vehicles. Um, and then was posted to an EOD regiment and then kind of got absorbed within that, still remaining a driver specialist, but obviously dipping my toe into the EOD space, uh, which I really enjoyed. And I kind of, you know, when you, you enjoy something, you find it kind of easy because yeah. you want to know more. You, you, you know, you kind of, it clicks with you straight away. Um, then got posted away from that and did some more driver specialist stuff. Came back. Uh, and I think we were on the same Herrick actually, because okay. I was on Herrick 6 as well. Were you on Her- Herrick 5 coming back to Herrick 6? People get confused with the years. So Herrick 4, Herrick 4 was 2006. Yes. Okay, so that's Herrick 4. No. So I was, uh, so, yeah, so... Well, and then Herrick 4 the, was one of the, the main one in 2006. Yeah, and then, and then it the commando Herrick brigade five, took the over. Yeah. And then I came halfway through that. Got you. So it would have been the end of Herrick 5. So like January time, was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of forgot where I was at now. Uh, yeah, so I went away, uh, Herrick 6, came back, um, 
did other bits and pieces, went down to Tidworth for a while, uh, then went back to Water Beach, where I was first posted, uh, and there was a job came up to do um, high research team commander. Strangely enough, that's where I met Mickey Yule. Uh, so we were all training at the same time. Um, and he, obviously, as he discussed with you, went out slightly earlier because of injuries. And uh, we were kind of held back for Herrick 13 and to go out there, deploy out there as high research team uh, as a whole. Uh, so, yeah. Herrick 13. Herrick 13. Oh, that was 2010, 2011. Yep. I was on that as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We cool. must have been kind of following each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't <laughs> realise. Right. Um, interesting. And when we were talking about when we were arranging this, in fact, I have to give a shout to uh, the Aardvark group. Oh, I, I, and absolutely. To, uh, yeah. And to Kate Lawler for uh, firing you across my uh, across my my path, so yeah. to speak, for the podcast. Very much appreciated. Um, and we'd come, probably come on to that later. Yeah, I yeah absolutely. Yeah. Later. But uh, where was I? Oh, God. Oh, yeah. You, when we were talking, you were saying that... Uh, see, the thing with the bomb disposal in EOD, everyone thinks... Oh, they think... Well, they immediately think clean clean cut, snip a wire here, snip a wire there, little robot gone in, you're on a street somewhere. But you were saying that you specialise predominantly in IEDs? Yeah, yeah. So um, the the whole sort of gambit of EOD um, kind of encompasses, you know, your CBRN, your search, high risk search, dogs, EOD, CMD, and then EOD, IED. Hang on. Hang on. People's minds are getting blown, right? I know my so, my mind's so just being let's, blown. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's go through the uh, abbreviations. So we know what EOD is: explosive ordnance disposal. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Okay. We, CBRN, so C- chemical, C- biological, radiological, yep. nuclear. Okay. Yep. What were the other ones you mentioned? Uh, so uh, um, CMD. CMD. So. Uh, Oh Christ, you put me on oh, spot no. now. Twenty seven years. Conventional munitions disposal. And then uh, your IED is improvised explosive munitions disposal. There was, there was another one. there was another one. There was something else. Was yeah. Dogs. Oh yeah. Well we know what dogs is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got yeah. Continue with the, the your IED specialization. Talk to me. Uh yeah, so I went away, did this search tour, Herrick thirteen. Um absolutely really alley it was mental you know it was like the wild west Go on. Uh, uh, you know you were literally just dropped into the middle of nowhere and you were uh supporting you know people from pf through to paras through to <coughs> infantry through to anyone that needed us effectively um and the jobs that you got up to were literally you know there's something over there we know there's something over there because we've seen something over there. And then it kind of came to a, but why is it over there? And then work, once you worked out the why is it over there, which no one ever really wanted to admit why that thing was over there. Um, why not? Why didn't want to admit it? Because you're setting patterns. And there's, that's the only reason why that thing is over there is because of pattern setting. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So it could be preemptive. Yeah, uh, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Because it, could be it might be they've. Th- yeah, because they've uh, they being the enemy of taking an action to force you to stop setting that action you were doing, force you off yep. a, like an, an MSR or something like that, and then it's predictable. Yeah. Where yeah. you're going to go. And then you're looking at VAs, VPs, aren't you? Which, you know, I have to go past that point. I have to slow down lots. There's only, you know, you're being canalized into one area. Uh, It's highly likely that there's something's going to be there, the obvious route. Mm. Uh, So that's what we try to avoid. Um, So, yeah, that that search thing, absolutely amazing when I was doing it. Uh, At the end of Herrick 13, you know, there were loads and loads of casualties. Um... And I kind of got to the end of that and I was like, oh my God, I literally did. And I, I, I took loads of film footage, loads of photos. Um, and it's the time when you reflect and you think, oh my God, 
this is this is me now. I'm being sucked into the search vortex world. Um, what can I do to get out? Because it was freaking scary when you when you reflect on what you've seen and what you've done, you know, um, and the likelihood of you being called in to something like that again was, you know, it was high. Uh, so I got back off that and said, right, I want to be an EOD operator because I don't have to then start searching for stuff. It's already pointed out for me. Uh, I just got there and deal with it. As in, as in make it safe? Yeah. As in, I, uh, someone has already done the hard job for me and found the IED uh, or the mine or whatever it may be. All I need to go up there and do is deal with it because I know where it is. Um, when you went on Herrick uh, 6, <coughs> yep. were you high risk search advisor there? No. Uh, so I went out there as engineer, close support. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. And they, so talk to me about becoming an EOD operator then. What does that entail? Is it, is it a, like a continuation of your high, of your high research knowledge and then building upon that to take it, taking you a stage further in your EOD job? <laughs> um, I, you know, a lot of the skills are transferable, uh, but search, you kind of look at the bigger picture. You're looking out the way, whereas with EOD, IED, you're kind of focused in on what's in front of you. You know, you're not looking for anything else per se. Uh, within your threat assessment, you kind of try and rule in or rule out if there's anything around that area. But you're primarily there to deal with what's been found, if that makes sense. Um, so back to your original question of, is it a progression? No, it's not. It's two totally different skill sets. Um, but they complement each other, if that makes sense. So I made that active decision to move away from being a search team commander, uh, progressing on then to search team advisor, to go down the EOD stream, which is conventional munitions disposal, and then obviously the improvised uh, device disposal. Is the process for dealing with the conventional and the uh, improvised, is the is the methodology to get to the point of making a decision on what action you're going to take on that device, is it the same for no. both? Okay, no. talk to me about that. No. Um, so with the IEDs, there you've got to try and get into the mindset of the person that made it, and it can be time, command, or victim operated, um, and that's primarily, and it can be made out of anything. You know, you could probably look around in your podcast office here and I can make several switches just from the stuff that you got in here. Whereas the CMD type stuff, the mines, grenades, projectiles, mortar systems, uh, they're all made to a certain specification. They've all been machined exactly the same. They've all got a purpose. So an IED could be designed by the person uh, to be a time operated IED um, but through their inability to understand what they're actually doing they may have turned it into a VO IED victim operated yeah so some instead of there's some form of mechanical countdown it's turned into something that all you have to do is touch it move it uh, open a door and because of the wiring that's incorrectly being wired, it could turn to a victim operated um, and vice versa. Or, I mean, we, we've all seen uh, the video clips of when the Taliban go to connect the button and they get a home goal. You know, that that's from that. When they're building one. It yeah. Out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, so, but in, in what I'm interested in is to talk about the process of well, I'm interested in it all, right? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. It's a fascinating subject. I've been on the receiving end of them. Yeah. But, I've, but so how you guys deal with it? And as you mentioned, I spoke to Mickey also. I've got the, the high risk. I mean, just just incredibly dangerous jobs. You have balls the size of fucking watermelons, right? Um, to do it. And to do it repeatedly as well. Um, and to still be around. <laughs> with all my fingers and toes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
you get a call from high risk search advisor or whoever device identified what is the process which you go through what information do you need first off so is this when we're on tour uh, or is this when we're back in the uk oh, it's I think we different. could talk about both because you, you mentioned your first call out which was the uk wasn't it yeah it was yeah. that was a suicide bomber in the uk yeah right that was while you're an eod operator yeah right let's talk about that first because okay. suicide bomber in the uk is just bananas yeah Go for it. Uh, right. Okay. So I this this was right at the start of my posting actually to uh, to Catrick, and uh, there was a call come through, and I genuinely thought that people were winding me up. So we got a call uh, from the uh, the HQ where we get our jobs from, um, and they said, right, okay, so on, uh, yeah, we've got a job for you. It's an IED. I was like, right, okay, give us the details. Uh, yeah. Um, it's coming through as a suspected suicide bomber. I was like, yeah, okay. Keep going with the details. <laughs> Reading me out the details. All right. Yeah. All right then. Uh, I'm about 45 minutes away. So um, Where was it? Saltburn. Where, where, Saltburn, where's that? Saltburn. Saltburn. Where yeah. Uh, so North Yorkshire, um, uh, just above Newcastle-ish. Yeah. Uh, on the coast. Uh, you just type in Saltburn bomber and all of the information comes up. Oh, go on. What uh, so, so I was like, oh, right, okay, number two, let's go. We've got a job. Um, and he's like, oh, what is it? I'm like, yeah, okay, you don't know what it is. It's a suicide bomber, isn't it, in Saltburn? He's like, what is it? He's like, yeah, come on, let's go over and we'll You still think it's a gag at this point? Yeah, right? absolutely, 100%. You know, because I can see everyone sat in the corner and they're just sort of, you can see the shoulders jumping off and down. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not stupid. You know, th this was at my 16 year point. Um, I'd been in the army 16 years, newly into uh, to this new EOD unit. Um, see people's arms jumping off and down. Get into the van, get driving. Okay, I suppose I'd best play the game. It says, uh, you know, it's on my computer. It's an IED suspected, you know, blue lights on. Okay, let's get all of the traffic out of my way. All right, three quarters of the way there, and I'm trying to get hold of certain people. And, you know, it's not, no one's answering. I'm like, yeah, this is a proper gag now. <laughs> and I come around the corner, and the first thing <coughs> I see was this heart vehicle. So this is a hazardous response team. So it's like a... You know your ambulances but they're all wearing helmets in there you know they go into major issued areas where you know they need some form of protection i was like okay just slow down a bit now i think and then as i came around the corner even more there was like a fire engine and then there was another fire engine and on the side of this, i couldn't make it i couldn't work out why this fire engine had like a 172 inch widescreen TV on it. I was like, and as I'm driving down, I can see my vehicle on this screen. Screen, And then uh, th this whole car park, it must've been like 120 meters by, I don't know, 90, 100 meters. It was a massive car park. The whole car park was full of outside agencies, police, ambulance, heart teams, fire crews, firearms, police officers. And I'm like, oh my God. It's real. They, they, they put a lot of work into this gag. <laughs> like a lot of work. Maybe it's not a gag. Um, so yeah, I get out. And it, it's, it's almost like everything just kicks into to play. All right, what have you got for me? trying to pretend that I'm completely cool at this point. Like, I've dealt with 50 of these. And it's your first ever call out? It's my first ever call out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, talking it through. Uh, and it turned out to be something that it wasn't. D talking what through? What are you talking through? What information are you getting? Yeah, so I, I'm trying to understand what is going on. Um, and there was more to it. And in some, some of these jobs, you kind of get given information 
And it's kind of key that you know where this information comes from or what this information is, but you don't get told. And you're kind of like, well, I need to know. <clears throat> well, that's the information. Okay, but I need to know where it's come from. Why, why, do, why is this believed? That's the information. Okay, but that's not helping me. I've asked you a specific question. Why are you giving me a generalized, this is the information, deal with it? For example, a question like what well, in this case? Um, we can go with why, why do you think this person is what you are believing she is? Well, that's just the information you're getting. Mm, okay, anything more? Are they spotted? Are they spot? Are they are they visually seeing something suspected to be a vest? Or uh, so if, when, it was, if it was a vest, yeah. Or, well, when we when we turn up, we ask a series of questions to gather our threat assessment and to understand whether it's time, command, or victim operated down the road. You know the device, um, and all of the questions that I was asking just didn't add up. You know, I was it was. It was a person that was buying stuff from a shop, um, and it all started because she didn't want to touch the stuff. What do you mean? So it, it was a B and Q style shop, and um, she had bought a list of items which I was given, um, and the person that was selling the items noticed that she didn't want to touch the items. Oh. I was like, right, okay. So, how did you get it in the bag? Oh, she just sort of like pulled her arm and then... Use a sleeve. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's not normal behaviour, granted. Um, but that, that doesn't constitute perhaps a, <laughs> you know, a suicide bomber insult then. Who called it in? Uh, so it was the person that was the cashier. The yeah, the, 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 the cashier. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 salesperson. Yeah, and and she reckoned it was an. Oh, I don't know if it's she. He or she reckoned it was a. They, this person was making an ID, assuming that it, she didn't want to get her fingerprints uh, on. Yeah, it. and she, and she was wearing a hijab. Um, oh. So again, uh, she was white, British white, um, but she had a hijab on. So then she was kind of, I think, putting two and two together and coming up with 15 rather than four. What were the items? Uh, try not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm asking. I've got my suspicions. Go on. Right, okay. Yeah, so people are fucking more and, 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 and this was, remember, this, this was back in 2012. Can I guess? Can I guess the items? Go on. Uh, black and nasty. Nope. Oh, uh, uh, batteries. Nope. Wires. Kind of. Nails. Nope. Screws. No. <laughs> Wire wool. Uh, I, I, you, you're not going to guess. <laughs> right, okay. So she bought two cheese graters and one was broken. So she got a discount on that broken cheese grater. Uh, a hook and eye set. So, the you know, the stretchy wire that you put up and then you screw the eye and then you screw the hook in that side, and then you can pop your neck curtain. Oh, yeah. So hook and eye set. Uh, soldering wire. So just a reel of soldering wire. Yeah. And a mechanical countdown plug-in timer. Oh, there's this person, the salesperson, is obviously watching something on TV, yep. like a film, perhaps. Yeah. I will mention no f names of films. <laughs> <laughs> You know the word <laughs> about the bomb disposal. <laughs> Jesus. So he sees the hijab, thinks suicide bomber. Yeah. Put two and two together and got five, I assume. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So what's the rest of the story? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, th this is all open source. So you can just type in salt burn bomber. Um, there was a, uh, a woman that was on the seafront. The whole of the seafront was evacuated. Um, 200 meter cord and put in place by the the firearms officers uh two firearms teams laser pointers straight ahead 
because they genuinely thought that she was a suicide, but a potential suicide bomber. She wasn't helping the situation because she was like, well, you think I'm a fucking suicide bomber? Do what you got to do. It's like, right, things aren't adding up here. I've got hook and eye sets. I've got soldering wire. I've got a mechanical rundown plug-in timer for your lights. You know, when you go on holiday, you set your timer. Yeah, that one over there. Just just like that. Hang on a second. I have a suicide bomber. (laughs) I've got a kettle. (laughs) I've got some patches on the wall. I've got a bottle of water. Suicide bomber. Uh, (laughs) Hang on. No, no, no. Because I don't look Muslim. Can't be. Probably. (laughs) Go on. Uh, So, yeah, the the whole of the seafront's closed down. Uh, Time's getting on now going through my questioning due to what what position I held currently at the time. Um, police had primacy because they thought that she was some form of suicide bomber. So I couldn't do anything even if I wanted to. Um, woman sat on the seafront like this. I think it was like eight hours she was in that position. What options did she have though, in all seriousness, to, to try and alleviate the situation? Uh, that that was kind of taken out of my hands. She just wasn't sort of complying whatsoever. So they were trying to say to her, "Empty your bag out." And then she was like, no, oh. "Fuck off." She oh. had like this like sack satchel thing, which was bulky, uh, and oh, yeah. there was a time difference between her buying this highly suspicious stuff <laughs> from the shop to her being found on the seafront. Um, so, yeah, she was literally there for like seven, eight hours, stressed position, completely not complying. Um, and I think it got to the point where a uh, a firearms officer you know, just went up there, emptied out the bag, pinned her to the floor, job done. Because if they didn't empty the bag, then that would have been when I stepped in to then send my robot down there to do, you know, all of the remote stuff to find something to then take positive ear the action but uh on opening the bag they found other stuff which was small bags of like beans they found a gas um boiler a couple of tins a couple of mugs strangely they found some soldering wire hook and eye set a mechanical rundown plug-in timer. Um, that was me. Job done. Got in a van, closed the job down on the computer and drove away. She was completely innocent, right? Yeah. yeah. So the mystery here, say, is what on earth did she go back and do with all those items? That is a bizarre shopping list. I know. I want to know. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. So I, th- I think after after this had all sort of uh, come together, um, she was sent to a, a mental rehabilitation sort of place. Um, and you'll find that, like, I would say most of the jobs that I've done UK mainland have been involving people that are disturbed in some way not fully there like away with the birds yeah no sort of malicious intent they're just doing it out of curiosity rather than i'm gonna make this to harm that person over there they don't generically they they don't do that job one done Job one. Easy peasy. Under the belt. Under the belt. Yeah, stick down your CV. Yeah, job job magnet. And that that's the that so that that was the name that I got after that because every time I was on duty, I got at least two jobs a day. And I loved it. Really? That many? Oh yeah, yeah. Two jobs a day every day. How often are you on duty? That's a lot. I was trying to get on duty all the time. How many call outs had I made? So, I mean, just in general, I know I'm generalizing. I know it varies from place to place. But in, in the UK, like for a, your area of jurisdiction for a team, yeah. how many call outs are you talking about? Well, I mean, it's all very dependent on where you are geographically in the UK. Um, you know, through a week, there could be two or three call outs per 
place or there may be 20 call outs you know there's loads of varying factors so first one is the weather if the weather's great then you've got metal detectorists out you've got people wanting to do renovations on the gardens you've got people wanting to put in extensions you've got magnet fishing you've got people generically out in the countryside even more finding potential bombs and stuff old munitions yep. you're talking about old world war ii munitions so whether they've been dropped by you know germany during the second world war or whether they'd been used by us as training on the build-up to the second world war or after okay okay and what has been your most challenging job then because have you got you must have a, you must have quite a few um my most i would say my most challenging job was a um a device that was placed to catch out an emergency service with a complex timer switch um and was quite large i'd prefer not to say what country i was in um but yeah that that was probably my most challenging um complex ied that i'd come across uh com so define define a complex ied for me <laughs> Uh, so something where it's using multiple power sources, multiple <coughs> switches, uh, complex circuit boards, uh, that that would constitute a complex uh, IED. And was it the most challenging because it was simply because it was a complex IED? Was it uh, environment? How much of a factor did environmental the environmentals play in yeah. terms of your ability to deal with something? Yeah. So uh, you know, my whenever i get called out my <coughs> first worry is safety of me safety of my team safety of the cordon safety of the general public and if i can't ensure 100 percent that i've ticked off all of those i can't do anything um so first of all i need to ensure the safety of everyone preservation of life uh, then we move on to preservation of property, which is slightly below the the life limiting um, sort of factor. Then forensic evidence. You know, we want to maintain that forensic evidence so we can catch the people that have carried out said sort of action and then return the situation back to normal as soon as possible. So they're the sort of like four categories that we need to hit. And if we can't hit one, which is number one, preservation of life, then we can't kind of progress, if that makes sense. How do you keep up to date with the methodology and modus operandi of um, of the people making these things and planting these things? Uh, so as, as part of the remit for us to carry out any form of uh, operational um, licensing, we need to first license. Um, so that that will be something that we would do continuation training that, that that's all it is continuation training which is then monitored assessed and then we get given you know the thumbs up for uk um mac a duties um and it, it's exactly the same going uh across to wherever it may be worldwide you would do a a beat up um training section and then you would be assessed viewed given the thumbs up and then sent out that way so that's where you would capture all of those updates um at modus and Raptor, you know all of that how they operate j2 type situations where you'd get updates from that um so yeah it's an ever-evolving beast ever-evolving and sometimes changing on a daily basis Mm. Um, have you ever come across uh, an, a, an incident where you, or a job where um, it's the old it's the old film thing isn't it you get there and you've got seconds to spare you've not got a lot of time Cause I'm assuming I, I'm maybe incorrectly that a lot of the time on, on the timed on the timed devices yeah. you, it's not there isn't the digital counter on the front of it showing you the seconds counting down is it there? could be really yeah have you had that have you encountered that uh I've not. 
I've not encountered the digital timers. Why would um, they want to display the time apart from... I know, mean, that, put... that, that would be something that they're doing just for their benefit. Uh, they're putting time, uh, minutes, hours, seconds, push the go <laughs> button, counts down, then sets off an alarm, which then is incorporated into the circuit, which then initiates the device. So have you ever had an incident where it's counting down? And you're, and you're like properly under pressure? Uh, I've had a mechanical rundown timer. Go on. Uh, so we were in a country that I won't name. Uh, sending the robot down the road, uh, it came across this item. And I only got given the, um, the details that there's a large tube there uh, and I could see some batteries uh, and some wires coming out of the end of this steel tube. Uh, so sent the robot down rather quickly, uh, then seen a mechanical rundown timer uh, along with a large steel tube, wires and batteries uh, and took out the power source. Pretty much job done. It wasn't complex, it was simple. Yeah, that, that type of thing is simple, yeah. How big was the device? Um, that big by about... So you're holding your... So like a foot and a half long... Yeah. Foot and a half long, and then, what's that, half a foot in diameter? Yeah. Big one. Yeah, it was, it was reasonable. It would definitely ruin your day if it functioned next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the biggest device you dealt with? Uh, that Probably that, that first one I was talking about, where there was a, um, a, dev a complex IED. Uh, which was probably that size. What's that size? Pe pe most people uh, to this. Uh, meter foot? long. A meter oh, yeah, long. Fucking hell! What? That, so the whole the size of the whole device was that. Yes. Uh, well, how much like uh, explosives were in there? Um, I'd say about uh, six inches worth. Four four pounds, five pounds. Yeah, yeah. And then augmented by nails and all that good stuff. What are they uh, in the UK? Mm, not in the UK, overseas, Middle East areas, should we mm -hmm. say? What are they predominantly using as the as the explosives? Uh, that will be some kind of fertilizer mixed with an oxidizer, and so it may so it's be not changed. No, no, no. It works. You know, it's really freaking good, and it's available. Obviously. And it's available. So it's exactly the same as what you would know um, as your, your, you know, your fertilizers rendered down mixed with said um, other oxidizers uh, and fuels to create the the explosives. Easy peasy. It is, and that, that, that's the scariest thing about it is, it is easy peasy. That, that, that's the really scary thing. Yeah, and, uh, and, and the information readily available online yeah, Unfortunately, yeah. Crazy. If you know where to look, if you know what to type in, um, I wouldn't <laughs> suggest to anyone that they do type in anything because there are certain words that if you type into the internet, like I should imagine, how to make a bomb, you would be probably getting a visit from someone. Yeah, do not do that, in all se yeah, do not do that people, in all seriousness. That is a kind of a, a 100% you will get a visit from someone if you start typing that type of search into the, the search engine. What's the turnover rate with a NEOD, like uh, uh, um, the ED operator end in terms of rotating in and out because of stress, mental health, pressure? Is it, how, how, yeah, talk to me about that. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've no, I think it's an accumulative effect. Um, so going back to Herrick 13, I was in Afghanistan um, and witnessed firsthand people standing on stuff. Um, it, that, that doesn't look real at the time. From my perspective, it didn't look real. It was like a skeleton hand where this guy had been degloved and, you know, uh, lost a leg and some of the skin had been pushed up and the rest of the skin had been sort of like stuck to the bastard bush. And it was really weird because it was his tattoo. Like I, the, I, I can't really recall. Bush. Yeah. I can't recall what it was, but it's some kind of football <coughs> tattoo. And it was literally pinned to the bush. 
pulled out of it. Yeah, it was pinned to the bush. It was really strange, um, but didn't think very much of it. Um, and as we were clearing through that road, and I, I, I can still see it now, um, where I didn't want this guy's foot to be mauled by dogs or, you know, his his skin to be eaten by animals or, you know, his, his body parts to be used against us. So I, I started picking up these body parts and putting them in a plastic bag. And they were obviously, we were carrying on the search, so I was picking up my fair share of the body parts. Um, and I was telling my young lads, right, if you come across any body parts, pick it up and put it in a bag. And that probably sounds quite mental, but at the time it was like very natural. Um, and where I said it was an accumulative effect, I think you keep seeing stuff like that. And then when you get back, you reflect on it. I think it does, yeah, it has, a, has an effect. Um, you know, you can type into the internet uh, suicides within the EOD world or uh, UK armed forces. You, you're going to get a few hits. Um, people okay. leaving, you know, you're going to get... A what is the, so is the, what are you suggesting the rates are fairly high? Compared uh, to the rest or not? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know whether they're fairly high, but I know of a couple of guys. Um, how big is the EOD? How big is the unit? Uh, uh, how, is, how, how big is the EOD? Yeah. Um, as a, as a organisation, yeah, it's, it's quite a big beast. Uh, maybe well, there's two regiments, three regiments. Then you're looking at all your support arms. What size are the regiments? Are they f between four and six hundred people? Okay. Uh, so they may not all be you know, EAD operators or searchers, they may be drivers or, you know, all of the different arms that you're going to get. Um, I, this is a pure guess, maybe 1,500 personnel involved. There may be slightly more. And how many do you know have killed themselves? I know at least two. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it, I, I, when I <clears throat> try and, I, it's like trying to, you have to try and, uh, what's the word? Um, oh God! I can't remember the word. You have to try and take it, take the numbers of relevance. Uh, not relevance, the wrong word. Oh, I can't remember the word, but I try and think of you know. There's a lot of stuff about mili ex-military suicides and and, and serving yep. military suicides and stuff. Yep. I always trying to. It's really hard to understand if there is a real problem, mm. as, or or if there's not really. Um, it's hard to understand. When you compare it to the civilian population, and I've heard people say that, I've heard people say that, and ministers as well say, I'm sure Mercer said it actually, is that the 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 suicide average suicide rates within the military is the same as what Civ Pop is. But then I think, I, I, like you, I know, I think at least two, mm. maybe one or two more, that have killed themselves. Well, that that's but, that's just EOD operators. So I've had a good friend very very recently also kill himself nothing to do with vod um he was a royal engineer um yes yeah, so, so the point is, so the point yeah. i was making is uh, yeah i mean direct yeah so i mean directly know within the military right yeah so if i used to speak to like i like i i don't think i know any civilians no. who know even one person that's oh no, no hang on i do there was a kid like there's a kid when i was in school and he killed himself but so all those school kids there know no they know of one person but he, he in terms of, like, now, not many, I wouldn't say many civilians know people, directly know people who've killed themselves. No. Maybe one. Certainly not two or three or four. No. And that is, and when I think about that, I think maybe there is a, maybe there is a situation. I mean, but it's one you can never really understand. You can never really sort of measure it like that properly. But... Mate, there shouldn't be any fucking suicides. No. It shouldn't be any. Not Absolutely. when, not when uh, you join the military, okay? And you, and which is a to me, if you join up and you go through that process of joining up, whichever arm, whichever service, that is a that is proof mm. that you are of a certain mental aptitude. Yep. You have a certain mental stability to be able to go through all that training and then and then go into every unit you are right. Mm -hmm. Um, 
which the point I'm making there is when there's civilian deaths, you don't sort of have that as a marker of, oh, someone com was completely mental stable at one point in their lives, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so when you have that, for them people to take their lives, it, it just, it's, um, just, it just shouldn't happen. It, it, no. it, shouldn't, I, it shouldn't happen anywhere, right? I'm not saying the military people's lives are any more valuable than the civilians. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to uh, understand, or explain, try to under, trying to understand um, the deaths. Yeah, but, sorry, go on. We were talking about, I went on a right tangent there. We were talking about uh, EOD stress levels. Yeah, so um, go on. Uh, so, yeah, accumulative. Uh, I think the more you get to see, the more it starts building up. And you you get opportunity to um obviously talk about these situations between the team your team members you talk about and generally that 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 will nip it in the bud um you you know you've acknowledged the fact that something's happened um you you've talked about it um and it then kind of sorts itself out as much as it can yeah uh but then you know the year two years down the road when you get to reflect about you know feeling to be able to he feel the heat of the rpg whizzing past your head whilst you're doing x y and z and then you're looking at your your youngest that's running around and you kind of think shit I could, if, if i'd slept slightly to the right or to the left at that point i wouldn't be seeing this now so you kind of start personalizing <clears throat> stuff and you're starting to re-traumatize stuff with or re-traumatize yourself with stuff that has happened, if that makes sense. So it has an accumulative effect of building up and building up and building up. Uh, some guys, you know, they can deal with it and you don't see any issues at all. Not, not anything. Uh, some people can't deal with it and they obviously right turn and, and leave. Uh, and then you get the other guys that are, you wouldn't know that they're not suffering, but they are suffering, but they're putting on a brave face uh, to the point where they either break or they right turn and leave and then suffer in silence on their own as a civilian. Hmm. Yeah, and common across, and that's common across all branches really, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. And guys and girls. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think it's improving now. I think yeah. things are improving. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, the fact we're having, we're having this conversation is, mm. is an indication. You know, I'd argue that 10 years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, you or I would not be willing to sit no. and talk about openly no. on a public thing like this, no. talk about mental health, for example. No. So, um, that's oh, something. it should be encouraged. Um, you know, I've had my fair share of situations where, you know, I've, I've been in a bit of a state, you know, and I needed help. Um, and I openly encourage people to, to take advantage of that because the stuff that we see and do as soldiers across the board, not just in EOD or search, it's not normal. Um, perhaps a little bit more normal now because we haven't got the Afghanistans going on. Um, but definitely some of the stuff that, definitely with some of your podcast members that I've seen and done, you've seen and done, that is not normal stuff for human beings to witness. So, you know, you've always got to be very cognizant of the fact that, you know, one day you may, you know, anyone that's been involved in that type of stuff may need a bit of a hand. It's a really good point, mate. Um, in that, uh, one of the light bulb moments for me when I was trying to improve and, and understand um, what was going on with me, one of the light bulb moments was where uh, a therapist uh, said to me that, because um, I, I couldn't understand why I was experiencing what I was experiencing. And and I said to, the, uh, to, to her, the first therapist I went to see, I said to her that, I said, look, I, I, I've got no issues with anything I did or any of the events I've just described to you or anything. I've got no issue, you know, um, whatsoever. Um, I said, these these things that happened to me this is involuntary like because mm. i they would I, they, I would talk through something uh, like um uh, an event and i i would i'd be talking like i am to you now at the same time say si, 
my eyes would be streaming. Yep. I'd be crying. Yep. But I, I'd be talking. I wouldn't feel like I'm crying. Like yep. It would be like complete subconscious. My eyes would be streaming. Com- yeah. And it would happen at random times. Um, and I said this, and I said to her, this, I, I'm not doing this. I don't, yeah. I don't feel like I'm crying. This is, I'm, I, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And she said to me what you said there. She said, you have to understand is that what you've experienced? That's not normal. It's no. not normal. It is so that the body's going to react. She said, you may think that you're completely accepting of it and everything else, but it's not normal. No. And, and, and the way it is, is we, we're conditioned, right? We were trained in it, not just the military, blue light services, any, yep. any job. Any I, I don't know how the medical service do what they do. Uh, good point. Don't, like, don't yeah, understand. Yeah, it. I agree. So we, we, when I say we, I mean people who uh, deal with high stress, high trauma events, yep. like, or are they going to have to, as a as a occupation, <clears throat> they're trained to do it. Hmm. Paramedics, doctors, police, firemen, fucking, uh, I don't know, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and yep. women, right? Yep. Um, and so we're trained to be able to deal, or 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 not deal with it, to operate effectively while that ev- event is going on. Yeah. Okay, and. But that, but what happens in high stress situations, whether your life's at risk or not, in high stress situations, uh, traumatic events, okay, your body. I know I'm preaching the converted. I'm I'm just talking for the benefit of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. You. Your your body does things that you cannot control. There are survival mechanisms triggered from it, from in your brain on a psych, psychiatric level to the physiological level. Chemicals are imbalanced. Hormones are. I mean, I was talking about this before in the past as a podcast guest, but there's stuff you can't fucking control. It. You could, as I just said, those events I experienced, I was absolutely fine in those. Mm. I don't have. I, I've never had flashbacks or like that. And yet, sometimes talking about them, sometimes thinking about them, triggers an emotional response yep. in me yep. that, that I am not conscious of. But mm-hmm. physically, I'm doing it. Yep. Streaming with. It hasn't happened for a long time. Streaming with tears. What is that? I'm going off my phone. God, sit right in the middle. Tense then. I was, I was, <laughs> I, was, I was, I was well, I was into it then. I'm fucking allowing off my phone, but it triggers a response. And that is an example of, um, it, 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 sorry, it's, it's reinforcing what you're saying. You, it's not normal you experience. So, and so to, to experience sort of adverse emotional reactions shortly after or years later, after your service, whether you think there's been a specific event or not, because there isn't always, always, that's fucking normal. Yep. That's normal. Yep. How did you see, how, what did you do when you, when you sought help? What did you do? Um, so it, this Do you mind talking in, about it? No, 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 okay, no. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to speak about it years ago. Uh, I would have been exactly the same as you. I would have been a blubbering mess. Um, so back to 2007, Herrick 6, right at the end of the freaking tour, um, we were at a place that wore a fob that we were building called Fob Arnhem. Uh, we were building that. And um, they were chucking in Chinese rockets at us, mortaring us. And we were all um, stood behind the HESCO, giggling to ourselves. Where was Arnhem? Uh, that was in the Lower Hanging Valley. Okay. Um, yeah, so we were getting a bit of income in, building this Sanger... Uh, we're inside this fob, <coughs> giggling to ourselves, and um, my hand was on the side of the HESCO, which is the big steel sort of like cages that we fill with earth to then build these blast fobs. protection. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> uh, six foot pickets fall down on my hand from the vibrations of the incoming IDF. Ouch! You would think, but I was like, ah, oh, shit. Carried on giggling, stopped, we carried on building. I just kind of tried to protect my hand a little bit. Uh, Carried on with the op, got to the end of the op, went back to Bastion. um, And my hand, for some reason, started getting worse. I I knew I'd done something bad to it, um, but I could still move it. But I mean, I don't know if you can see, it's got like a little little bend in it. Um, And it was getting worse and worse over a period of like two or three days. So I was told, go to the the doctors, see what you've done. Uh, Went there and um, they were like, right, okay. And as soon as I, it was like, as soon as I stepped in to that hospital door, 
it was like someone had a soldering iron and they put it straight into my finger. And I was like, "What? what's going on? This is like berserk. This is crazy. This is like, th this pain is horrendous. Uh, so they gave me a ring block. So they put a needle down that side of the knuckle, down that side of the knuckle. In between it. your fingers? Yeah. I'm not good. And this needle was about that long. And I was like, oh my God. Took away the pain. I was like, oh, jackpot. <laughs> yeah, but that only lasts half an hour. Half an hour went came back and I was like yelping in pain again morphined up uh, they just chucked the whole pharmacy at me uh, I was like a zombie got kazi back to the UK spent a month and a half in Birmingham um, but prior to being kazi I saw um, some Afghan children with an Afghan civilian in hospital in Bastion um, and these children had been fragged and had a lot of brain or head injuries. Um, and I remember this, this, these two children with like little dish dashes on, and it was almost like I was thinking, were these children trying to look the way they looked? And it was almost like they were lobotomized like they didn't know where they were they were just sort of walking um and they were trying to get the attention of this adult um and there was a little girl there as well had half her head shaved and you know you could see these these areas where the surgeons had gone in and had to pull out bits of fragmentation was this Bastion? yeah okay. yeah um and i was witnessing all of this in this chair with like my finger that looked exactly the same as it did now but it was in like this splint thing and it kind of rested like that and i was thinking looking to the right of me and there was like gunshot wound to the chest there ied strike to my left little children walking around i mean i think we even had a, a prisoner of war that had been shot a couple of times and lost his leg uh, but he was getting treated as well um and the, the these children were trying to get the attention of this Afghan Afghan adult. And it was literally these this this little girl and this little boy were swept to the side because all he wanted to do was give this older lad a cuddle and comfort him. Uh I I, I just didn't understand why they would push these children I, uh, really good. And I was there was one girl okay. and a young boy. Um and I was like, th this sounds like it was over a protracted period of time, but it wasn't. It was like within a minute and a half of me witnessing this. And I was like, I couldn't understand. I couldn't really understand why things were playing out the way they were playing out. Uh, and I later found out that because it was a younger child and a female, they meant nothing to this village elder. The person that was the important person was the eldest child. And I, I just didn't, I, didn't, I couldn't get that. Um, Kazivak back to the UK, uh, hit Birmingham, got in the bus, and there was a young lad there, head injury again. I'm like, oh God, another head injury. As we pulled up to the hospital, I could see this, and I can see, see him in, in my head now. I can see him now. And he was sort of like sat, over there with a nurse, um, big bandage on his head, vacant look, and he got up with this nurse, and you could see his wife outside the bus, obviously waiting for him to come, and as he got stepped down off this, his wife went up to him, and it was like he didn't recognise her, it was like no emotion, no, it was just like, carried on walking and that 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 affected me for ages walking with her just no, show, no just, just didn't didn't uh, didn't, just recognize didn't recognize her. Carried no on. no there was no acknowledgement what did she do obviously she was really upset you know and then i took my turn got off the bus got onto a push chair and wheeled off and i was woken up in a ward somewhere in birmingham 
with people in burkas and I was like, oh my God, I actually thought that I was in a hospital in Afghanistan because I woke up surrounded. No one had told me anything. I was on so many drugs. I woke up with all of my kit on like that, starfished on the bed and it, people in burkas, dish dashes. I was like, oh, right. Okay. This is different. It looks less sandy in here. Um, it's cooler as well. Where's the, the tents? Why am I on a proper bed? And then worked out that I was in a holding um, bed until I, I I was moved up to the, the military ward. What was that for, your finger? Yeah. Fucking hell. So going back to all of this, this was brain smudging, which I never knew it, anything about. It was what? Brain? Brain smudging. Brain smudging. Yeah, Go which on. is an actual thing, which I didn't really understand. Um and because uh, I made that psychological sort of, right, that can't hurt for the next 15 days because I am on this up. I need to get this done. When the, when the picket, six foot pickets fell in your hand, yes. you blocked the pain. Go on, yes. Okay. So my brain blocked the pain. I carried on. The brain's incredible, isn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't work out. So as soon as I let my barriers down stepping into the hospital that's where the pain racked up i started witnessing all of these things which had nothing to do with the pain by the way that that was my exposure to um trauma that affected me mentally rather than physically my hand um but yeah i had i had something called brain smudging where my brain couldn't understand or it didn't know how to deal with what would would have been relatively painless turned it into something where it felt like i'd a red hot poker on my finger constantly uh and i had four months of rehabilitation jesus yeah i i said to them cut my finger off in fact cut my hand off i wanted them to cut my hand off and they said that wouldn't make a difference. Because it would be the phantom pain then, wouldn't it, I suppose? Yep. And you want them cut it off because the pain yeah. is so horrendous. Yeah. Jesus. Yep. That's yep. crazy. Mm. Yeah. How many people call you a bluffer? <laughs> you would think quite a few. Um, but none. Jesus none. Christ. It, as soon as I thought that, I, I, I couldn't understand it myself. No, I couldn't understand where all of this pain... Because my hand didn't look any... I mean, it was a bit black there, you know, and I couldn't stand touching it. Um, well, it would have been bruised. Those pickets are heavy. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't break anything. Didn't break anything. Uh, I had an MRI scan on it. Um, but what I did do was damage a lot of the nerve ends, nerve endings around there, which then, for whatever reason, got brain smudging didn't know it was a thing and then they brought out this book explained it to me and they were like this is actually a thing um yeah month and a half later out of hospital on a severe amount of drugs for nearly seven or eight months all because of this hand <laughs> and things that i saw obviously so going back to the question <laughs> Yeah, well, we must have gone if... massively off piece there. There's no we, it's you. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not complaining. Uh, where, what did you do to seek help? So just, just... Uh, yeah, so I went and saw CPN nurse. You know, I said I need help. You know, I was... If I mentioned that lad getting off the bus, all those little children, I would have been a bumbling mess um, instantly. Instantly. Um, so I went and saw a CPN nurse, yeah. CPN then? Uh, so that, that, that's the, the military sort of... Um, um, mental health? Yeah, mental health nurses. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so they, they specialise in mental health. Never heard of that. Yeah. They, were they around when I was in? Was yeah, it, was yeah they, they would have been, yeah. Yeah, so oh, back in 2007 in uh, Salisbury. Uh, yeah, that's oh, where yeah. I went. Oh, okay. So... Um, yeah, I was in a proper mess. I can't be like. How long did it take you to get out there to get to get to a good place? 
Um, I don't think you ever ever completely return to how you were. You, I think your brain changes, doesn't it, on a, a physical level. It's, it's something that's been exposed. You've tried to hide it or compartmentalize it. It's acted almost like some kind of disease which then, you know, changes that bit of the brain. Um, so, you know, I, I don't feel overly brilliant about thinking about that guy stepping off the bus and not recognizing his wife and his and, and he, she had a tiny baby as well um and these little afghan kids that were getting pushed away uh well experience experience changes you as a person like you or i wouldn't be who we are now if we didn't have hmm. experiences we would yeah. be we would be like kids in adult bodies which arguably we are sometimes in drinking <laughs> beer <I> suppose, right? <laughs> but um your experience changes over time yeah the, uh, the in that situation you're talking about people with uh you know experience real bad mental health issues for, because of an experience as you pointed out there you can't ex expect to go back to who you were because mm. you, you just can't this, no. this shit's changed yeah. that's another thing i had to deal with is uh, I was I was of the mindset that I want to be who I used to be. Mm. I I want I want my mental state to be what it was then. Yeah. Because I liked things about myself mm. then. I had a really good memory, for example. <laughs> you know, I was really disciplined. I was really focused. You know, yeah. And 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 I'm not anymore. Um. Or I find it really challenging to to be to. Uh, it's a real effort to do it to be really disciplined, really focused. Um. Uh, for any any protracted length of time, mm. uh, it's really difficult. But as pointed out to me by a different therapist. He said, have you ever considered that instead of think, constantly thinking about, I need to get back to who I was, have you ever considered that that's who you are now? Hmm. So that doesn't mean, that's not me saying accept all those shit things about that, you, that, the, you know, that mental ill health. It's not about accepting it. It's about getting rid of the stuff you can get rid of, pulling yourself back to a baseline of contentment, of, of healthiness, mental health, physical health, and then, and then see who you are. Yep. You, you, you have changed. It's just those small changes that occur over time, they'd be masked by the massive symptoms yep. you're displaying for whatever is causing it. Yep. Depression, anxiety, fucking unhappiness, mm. sadness. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, it's a good point, mate. It's a good point. You, you just... And that, that kind of leeches out as well. So that can leach out to people that are closest to you, in my experience. So... At times, I've had low points, which can then get picked up on children. Children can pick up that you're not quite acting like dad. Or the wife can pick up on it. And that can, you know, almost suck energy from them. That positive energy can be infected with your negativity, your anxiety, your unhappiness your problems with dealing with situations that aren't normal um and the problem there is that so people can um then consider themselves a burden yeah and either well cut away from those people they feel like they're burdening um either cut away physically and that like leave for example or cut away from fucking life mm. so, and and that is the i mean I never. I always, I'm always conscious. I never know what mental state people are in when they listen to this. So it's always, you know. Uh, and so, I mean, if that's someone listening, then that is like cutting away is not the answer. If 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 you're in that situation where you feel like you're a burden on people because of what you're experiencing yourself emotionally, then the answer is, you seek help. You speak to someone. Fucking drop me a fucking message if you need to. Drop a sign message if you need to. But you speak to someone. You go and seek help because it is there. It's yep. just re. It is. It's almost, and it can be impossible to see when you're in a really bad place, impossible to see there's any option or solution. And there, there fucking is. Mm. There is. There, there's you, always a solution. And you can't, you, those solutions and problem, uh, solutions and that help won't be exposed to you. Those answers won't be exposed to you if you don't look or if people don't know you need it, which step one is like, you fucking talk to someone. Yep. Talk to someone. I'm having a rough time in a minute. Okay. That's it. Um, I didn't think we were going to go on the mental health route today, mate. I didn't I'm either. I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did. Yeah. I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did. Because um, it's, it's useful. It's interesting your experiences, especially on, you know, like you said. I mean, you you, you, you you know, you mentioned about, you don't know, how, how a medical profession do, do it. 
and I know what you mean. I'm going to make you a paramedic in London. But at the same time, you're sitting here thinking, I don't know how the fuck you do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Every time it's mental. <laughs> to me, it's mental. But then I suppose it's because we don't understand. I don't understand your trick. I'm not knowledgeable of it. Yeah. You know, in the same way as the paramedics and stuff. Whereas, uh, I, you know, I, I would like to think you'd think the same thing about going and doing what I used to do. Well, yeah. Like, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that to people like you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You were saying before we uh, before we went on air, you did a, you did you've done a, you've run almost a full marathon this morning. Yeah. Right. Before you came, well, this morning before you started work, you've been yep. at work. Uh, no, no, no. My boss, uh, I've got a a real um, kind boss that allowed me to have today off uh, to come. We'll go do a marathon. I was supposed to be doing fifty miles. Uh, but then realised that I'd started too late and didn't want to push it too hard. Cause How I many miles be did you do? Uh, so just shy of 30. This morning? Yeah. And what are you doing after this podcast? Another marathon. Why? So 26. <laughs> Why? Uh, tr- so... <laughs> you fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah, I get that quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to be taking on a challenge on the 1st of June to swim the channel. Firstly, which is 21 and a bit miles. Uh, then I'm going to cycle from Land's End to John Groats, uh, which is a thousand miles. It's, it's, it's shorter if you went and took a more direct route, but um, that's avoiding the, the fast and dangerous motorways. And then I'm going to run from John Groats back down to Bista, which is around about 733 miles, which is about 54 miles a day, every day for two weeks. How do you train for that? <laughs> Can you train for that? <laughs> uh, um, so I, I, what I've been trying to do is just get my body uh, capable of doing... Um, it doesn't need to be fast running. I'm not a particularly fast runner. Uh, so when I was doing my 26 marathons in 26 days, I was trying to hit the four-hour point on each of my marathons. So I managed to do each marathon in and around four hours, um, you know, which is relatively quick for some people, but relatively slow for, you know, your more, your, your faster people. Um, so I kind of forgot where. How do you, you train for it? Uh, so lots of, lots of running, lots of cycling and swimming. What about are you getting are you picked up any are you picking up any injuries? Like no, so I'm being very cognizant of the fact that I do a lot of heart rate training. So I will only stick to certain heart rates when I'm out. Lower the heart rate, lower the 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 heart rate zone, the less likely you are to be injured. So I do a lot of my training in heart rate zone two, which is utilizing my body fat and carbohydrates that I'm taking on board whilst exercising rather than cannibalizing my body in zone three, zone four, where it's taking a lot of the energy from the muscles, which then you start building up all of that horrible sort of lactic acid. That is fascinating. I, I've got a friend who called, called Jack Russell, he's <coughs> ex-military, ex-3 power, a fucking mega bloke. And uh, he, he recently, I don't know how, but well, recently he's been, we, were, we were talking and he was mentioning about this new way of training he's doing, mm. and it's to do with heart. I'm sure it's to do with heart rate zones. Yeah. But he's using a specific. He's using. He's got a. He's got some. Like I wear a whoop strap. He's got something like a whoop strap where he's yep. measuring it, but it's it's tailored for that kind of training. That he's yeah, doing. yeah. I wonder if it's yeah. doing the same. So thing. it's like this watch here. What's that? Uh, so that's a. Uh, I don't want to say what make it is. Oh, you can say but, what make it is. Uh, it's a Polar Polar Vantage V. Okay. Uh, which effectively manages loads of different sort of algorithms in heart rates. It, it, it's got Alexa, uh, um, electro, what, when it's, it's telling out your arms moving, how your arms moving, and it's connected to GPS. Accelerometer. That's the one. Right, yeah. um, <laughs> get there at the end. And then you download it at the end of your, your run. And it tells you what your heart rate's been doing throughout the run. It can tell you elevation, um, so you, the amount that you've gone up and gone down. Uh, and it will also take into consideration your effort with regards to power in wattage. Uh, and it will also take into account your power in wattage going uphill 
which will then give you a estimated speed of what you would be going if you were going straight. Uh, likewise, it will take away speed from you if you're running downhill. It will say, right, well, effectively, if you were running on a straight, you are running slower. Uh, so there's loads of different sort of data points that you can take from that. Um, and it will it will give you something saying you are getting fitter. This is where your VO2 max is now. And it's an, it's a guesstimated VO2 max, but it's a good uh, guesstimated VO2 max due to the fact that it's taken on board all of these different sort of uh, measures. Mm. Have you ever done anything like this before? Apart from... As in crazy, <laughs> crazy fitness things? Uh, so it all started um with a mud run that my wife and her friends said yeah i'm gonna do this and raise money for wolf run by any chance yes <laughs> i was like kate my missus kate has done that yeah, yeah. i was like yeah whatever i don't want to have anything to do with that i hate getting muddy hate it can't stand fucking soldier <laughs> exactly what, what what is that all about <laughs> I've got to be committed. I either get completely muddy or I stay clean. Um, don't have any dirt on me. Uh, but yeah, it started there. Uh, long story short, one of her friends pulled out. I got <coughs> roped into doing it. Did the, the mud run. Really enjoyed it. Did the next one, did the next one, did the next one. Got the massive wolf run medal. I was like, yes, I'm in there. Um, needed more, so I started with half marathons. Wanted a bit more of that, so I went on to a full marathon. Then I did the London Marathon 2017. Thought that was wicked, but lost the buzz for that again. And then I need more. Uh, and went and did a duathlon, where it's a run, bike, run. And that almost destroyed me. That was one of the hardest things I'd ever done. Why is that? I just didn't train for it. I, you know, I thought that I was fitter than I actually was. And I wasn't that fit. Um, this was around 2017. And uh, the guys that we had coming through on course at the time said, oh, yeah, I've done an Ironman. I've done this. I've done that. And I'm like, oh, wicked. Yeah, I want to do that. That, that. that sounds awesome. Um, went and did this duathlon, which half killed me. I was like, you know, massive respect to anyone that could do an Ironman. This thing, you know, just like quarter, not even quarter of what this Ironman thing was um and that almost killed me went back to my half marathons and then i was like right i'm gonna do it i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna go for this half iron man and it did the half iron man um i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do this full iron man so in the june i did the half iron in the july i did the full iron in 2019 <coughs> 2020 pandemic right i'm stuck at home can't do anything I'm, you know i'm a soldier i'm used to helping in a crisis uh so a 2.6 challenge came up right i'm going to run 26 marathons in 26 days i forgot the point <laughs> <laughs> uh so yep yeah, did that and i had it all live on youtube because oh, I thought, you know, I'm going to get people saying, oh, you didn't do it, but you're just saying that you've done it. So the easiest way around that was I set my uh, camera, which is attached to my laptop, up, pointed that at me, and just went on my uh, running machine. Run machine in my gazebo. Yeah. Did that every day for 26 days. And then at the end, I ran into the camp and finished. And... Uh, it was some of the people at the end, uh, they were like, oh, what are you going to do next year? Are you going to swim the channel or something stupid like that? And that kind of stuck in my head. I was oh, like, I couldn't God. get rid of it. I couldn't. I was, I was desperately trying to downplay what I wanted to do. And I was like, you know, you could cycle to Land's End to John O'Groats. Oh, you could run from John O'Groats back down to Land's End. Oh, why don't I just do all three? <laughs> and I'll do it in 26 days as well. Jesus. Yeah. So. When do you start? Uh, first of June. Yep. When are you? When are you going to be? So when you do? When do you plan on hitting John O'Groats? Uh, John O'Groats will be around the 13th of June. Yep. 
I'll be going through there on about the fifth, unfortunately. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's mega, mate. What's it in aid of? Uh, so trying to raise money for the Phoenix Fund Bond Disposal Charity, which again deals with the issues that we've talked at length about. So all they have to do is get in touch with Mel uh, at the Felix Fund. Um, and Felix. Felix. Felix, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and the Hummingbird Centre, which is a cancer support centre. Um, and, you know, I've had quite a few people say, oh, I can understand the, the, the bomb disposal charity side of things. Um, my mum was suffering or found out that she had breast cancer two years ago. Uh, and it was just before, was it, no, a year ago. Yeah. Um, and it was just before everyone said, right, operation stop. You know, we've got all of these COVID patients. Let's get them all in hospital. And she had a mammogram and they found something, had the operation, had it removed. And luckily enough, you know, she she's just had a mammogram again and everything's great. Everything's all clear as it stands at the minute. Um, but that period in between, right, Mrs. Hannaford, you've got a, a lump in your breast and it's cancer to, you know, only a couple of months ago where my mum was told, yep, you're in remission. It's it's not there at the minute. Um, you know, she could have probably done with a little bit more support than she actually got down in Plymouth. Um, so the Hummingbird Centre is something in the Bicester area which provides that 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 kind of cover, that kind of support obviously they can't provide it in the way that they used to prior to covid but everything sort of like turning itself around now uh so they can start welcoming people back into the center um, and i thought you know what if what if the hummingbird center was down in plymouth and my mum had that opportunity to be able to pick up the phone and say no, hello, Mel. Um, I need some help. You know, being able to talk to a professional counsellor um, about medicines because the medicine that they put her on, some of it was worse than the actual illness of cancer. You know, which a lot of people don't realise. You know, they oestrogen blockers. Well, that to uh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And because it was a, a breast um, cancer, they gave her an oestrogen blocker, which completely messed with her mind, you know. Crazy. Yeah. Um, is there a GoFundMe for your, your endeavours? Uh, yep. Yeah, so uh, type in Felix Try 26. Felix Try. Uh, yeah. So all one word. Uh, try as in T-R-Y. Yeah. Yep. T-R-I. T-R-I. Oh, Felix Try. Triathlon. Yeah. yeah, yeah Felix yeah. Try. T-R-I. TRI 26, uh, and it will bring you up my YouTube page. It will bring you up um, my GoFundMe page, um, and that's where you'll be. I mean, if, if, if people are interested, uh, just type in Cy Hannaford on YouTube. Um, I'm planning on streaming it live again this year. So all I need to do is get a 1,000 subscribers on my YouTube, turn my phone on, and I can stream everything live. Um, the how swim. Many, how many you got now? Uh, so I've got 400, 400 subscribers. I'll get you close, hopefully. 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 Um, you know, because my mum's down in Plymouth, and she would really like to see the start of the swim. Oh, because you need 1,000 subscribers to go live on yes. YouTube, don't you? Yes. God's sake. Well, oh, man. Yeah, right. Okay, I yeah, got you. Yeah, I got you. Which is an absolute pain in the ass. So you can, do, you, you can stream live from a, um, a hard point in the house. So from a base station computer, you can't do it on them. But mobile. you can't do it on mobile. You have to have a thousand subscribers, which is an absolute pain. How are you going to do it if you don't hit a thousand? Uh, I'm just going to have to record and then try and sort it out that evening. If not, um, I'll have to record everything and then do it after the fact. Well, it's not critical, mate. It's doing it that counts, right? I, 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 yeah, one hundred percent. You know, um, hopefully there's going to be some media interest and. You know, my mum can see it, watch it on the TV, which would be nice. 
Yeah. yeah. So Felix try Felix try twenty twenty six. See, I like I'll make a donation for the podcast as well, mate. Oh, that that uh, was really nice. Anyways. Thank you. And um, how do people follow you on social media if they want to follow you? Uh, so I am an absolute social media biff. Uh, I'm really not that good. I mean, I literally had. Uh, I, I tell this story quite often. Uh, so I got my um, Facebook account last year last year yeah. at the start when I was doing the 26 marathons in 26 days <laughs> and I got up in the That's morning a bad thing. and I was like I, I tapped this Facebook thing and it said what's on your mind <laughs> and I, I, I tapped into it you know where I'm going with this yeah. don't you <laughs> <laughs> so what's on my mind well I was on like day four of my 26 marathons in 26 my fucking legs hurt send Put it on the side, and my wife comes running upstairs. Sai, what have you done that for? I'm like, done what? I'm just chilling out. I'm just relaxing. Why have you just told everyone on Facebook that your fucking legs hurt? <laughs> I said I didn't. It's that ask me how I'm feeling. <laughs> yeah, you've just sent that out to everyone that you know on Facebook. Brilliant. Yeah. So, um, Sai Hannaford uh, for Instagram, I think it is. I'm assuming it people are gonna. Yeah, it's my face on there, so if you can see my face, so S I Hannaford, um, Henny Ford, Henny Ford, Henny Ford. Yeah, yeah. Um, Twitter again. So I think that's Simon Hannaford. He'll find you. Yeah, yeah. You can't the important one is Felix Try Twenty Six. Yeah, hashtag Felix Try Twenty Six, and then that should bring you up a list of things um, that social media wise. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for coming down to the studio. Yeah, no, no, it's been absolutely wicked. And can I just say one real quick thing? Uh, on. Depends on what it is. Thank you. Go on, my, yeah, of course uh, you can. Shameless plugs, go on. Uh, so thank the sponsors. So firstly, Aardvark Group. If this, if it, if it wasn't for them sponsoring me, you know, uh, and David getting in there, and I, I, I literally texted him and he's like, yeah, I love the idea of this. All over it. So Aardvark Group, massive, massive thank you. Uh, Camper Kings, I don't know if you heard of them, but they're going to give me a, a vehicle for the full four weeks of the challenge, so I don't have to sort of like stay at bed and breakfasts. I literally stop at the side of the road. Hey, Camper Camp. Kings. Yeah. Uh, so Camper Kings, you know, really, really great, grateful to them. MP Aerospace uh, that design all of the bomb suits. Uh, pro I didn't mention that. So the first mile of my run is oh, going to be in a bomb suit. God's sake! Uh, or an IED <laughs> suit. <laughs> Why uh, make it hard on yourself? I know. Well, oh I, I, I told my boss yesterday. And he was like, ah, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> the first mile of arm suit, so WP Aerospace, yeah. Yeah, uh, N, N, NP Aerospace. Oh, NP, sorry. NP, November yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we've got Pearson Engineering that make all of like the mine plows um, that fit onto the front of the, the tanks there also. Uh, sponsoring so thank you massive thank you to them because if it wasn't for them i wouldn't be able to do it i wouldn't have been able to buy the three pairs of trainers that i need at 500 pounds or you know ridiculous amounts um so massive thank you massive massive thank you mega mate good luck with it cheers i look forward to watching you do it <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there having a beer going <laughs> jesus christ he did he went ahead and did it good luck with it mate in all seriousness cheers. and um Let's go get a drink. Cool.